OK, Stoner chapters 9 to 11. Let's see, I have my book in front of me right now. OK, first question. When did you first start to suspect that Walker may not be entirely honest? And why then? So we first meet Walker. Um, when he's trying to get into Stoner's class. And Stoner very uh, reasonably asks him whether he is ready for this class because it is an upper level class and it's not very easy. Uh, so here we see he asks Walker, what's your specialty? The class is on uh, medieval English. So uh, Walker says his specialty is the romantic poets. Now romanticism, Longmanjui, was at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. So it's very far from the medieval period of this course. Um, now, when Stoner asks if it's possible for Walker to take the course uh, in a later year, we see his reaction here. What page is this on? Um, page 131, I believe. Yes. Um, so you can take, you can wait until next year, Stoner says. Walker, look at Walker's reaction. His eyes shifted away from him. Now, in real life, it is very common for people who are talking in a conversation to not look at the other person. Think about this. When you're talking with your friend, if the person talking to you keeps staring into your eyes, that kind of feels creepy or even scary. It's natural to look away when you're talking, but in fiction, when this is emphasized, when the, the novel specifically tells you this happens, uh, then usually it means the person is being dishonest or even lying, especially because here it uses this word shifted. In English, we have a, an adjective called shifty ending with a Y, which means uh, unreliable, dishonest, cannot be trusted. So here the fact that the word is shifted also suggests that Walker here is being dishonest. He's not giving the real reason why he wants to take the course now. Uh, and the reason he gives is that the school has a kind of rec a regulation, a rule about how many courses a PhD student uh, can take each year. And he uh, in order to fulfill this rule, he has to take one course this year. So Stoner, you know, he's a smart guy. He understands that what Walker is really saying is on page 132, you don't really have a very special interest in this course, do you? Well, of course he doesn't. He just needs a course, but he can't say that. So Walker again lies through his teeth. He says, Indeed I do, sir, indeed I do. It will be most helpful in my dissertation. Um, although not quite sure why it would be helpful or how. Um, and so Stoner, of course, he can't say you're lying. It's incredibly impolite. So he has to try to get Walker to give up in some other way. Uh, so he tries to scare off Walker by saying, this is a rather specialized class, and I don't encourage people to enter it unless they have a particular interest, which means if you don't care about the class, you will have a hard time understanding what we're talking about. So Walker gives the only possible answer, which is I do have a particular interest. No, he doesn't, but he has to say this to get into the class. OK, Stoner nods. He realizes he's not going to get an honest answer out of Walker, so he, instead he gives some tests. How is your Latin? Uh, in the medieval period, English as a language had not yet developed. 
uh, serious literature and serious uh, written words were in Latin. So Walker, of course, says, oh, I have good Latin. I haven't taken my exam yet, but I read it very well. Uh, again, so this is also kind of giving an excuse for why he doesn't have proof that he has good Latin. Uh, Stoner tries again. Do you have French or German? Uh, and Walker gives the same answer. Yes, I just haven't taken the exams yet. So in other words, Walker doesn't care. He just really wants to get into this course. And to prevent further tests and questions, Walker brings up the name of his advisor, Dr. Hollis Lomax. He says, Dr. Lomax said he thought I would surely be able to do the work in this seminar. So he's bringing in the authority of another teacher. If Stoner at this point says, uh, Walker, you're not going to do well. I won't let you in. In effect, Stoner would be saying that Lomax is lying. And he can't say that because they're colleagues. They still have to work together. So Stoner sighs and lets Walker in. So it seems quite obvious here that Walker is not very an honest person. And we can tell here Walker's uh, response at the bottom of page 132 is to say, I'm sure you won't regret letting me in your class. Now, uh, today some of you might think this is a good polite response, but in fact what it's really saying is if you were regretting it or if you were about to regret it, I will let, make it so that you will not have a reason to regret letting me in your class. So of course Stoner gives the reasonable person's response. The question had not occurred to me. I never even thought of regretting it. In other words, I never thought that you would do poorly in my class, which of course is also not true, but it's the polite thing to do, to say. Um, and then later on, uh, if during that conversation, you still did not think that Walker uh, was dishonest. We can look at uh, the later evidence on page, for example, 134 near the end. Uh, Walker enters the room late. Now, I know some of you also ha usually enter a classroom late. And it's not a good thing. It tells the teacher that uh, unless you have a good reason, if your reason is simply, oh, I was too tired or I fell asleep or, or I was having lunch. If you don't have a real good reason, it tells the teacher that you don't really care about this course. Um, so here, this is also a sign of Walker's dishonesty. He says that he he is interested in the course, that he needs the course, and yet the first day he arrives late. Also pay attention to what he misses. This is very this will come up later. Um, what is Stoner talking about? Uh, here it is important to, that we realize that these arts of rhetoric, grammar and dialectic meant something to a late medieval and early Renaissance man that we today can only dimly sense without an exercise of the historical imagination. What this means is uh, he has previously said that uh, they will be studying works of rhetoric, uh, grammar, and dialectic, which means arguing, debating. And here Stoner is saying, for example, the art of grammar is not merely a mechanical disposition of the parts of speech, which is what we think of as grammar today. Like what is a noun? What is a verb? How is a sentence correct or not? Uh, in the early days of the medieval period, uh, the study and practice of grammar included also the study of poetry and its technical felicities and an exegesis of poetry in both form and substance. So it's not just grammar, it also includes poetry, the skill of poetry, the reading of poetry. That's what exegesis means. Exegesis means uh, interpretation, reading. 
Uh, so grammar includes poetry. Uh, but look at this when Walker walks in and he finally sits down and he starts listening to Stoner's lecture on page 135. Uh, near the bottom, Walker suddenly says, pardon me, I don't understand. What can grammar have to do with poetry? Real poetry. Uh, so we can see that not only is Walker arriving late, he is also not. How do I say this? He's. Um, he does not consider being humble about things that he might have missed. Right, think about this. If you take a course on literature and you walk in late and the teacher keeps talking about grammar. As if grammar is literature. You might reasonably think to yourself, maybe I missed something at the beginning of the course. Maybe the teacher gave a reason he's talking about grammar. But here Walker, uh, I think we can safely say quite arrogantly assumes that uh, Stoner is just wrong. Uh, and of course, arrogance may not be dishonesty, but it can be one reason someone is dishonest. Uh, if they are so concerned about always being right, that they are willing to bend the truth or even uh, skip over the truth in order to uh, prove or you know demonstrate that they are still right. Moreover, at the top of page 136, we have another example. Uh, Walker is trying to catch Stoner in a contradiction. Stoner has just said that the poets and dramatists, which means playwrights, of the Middle and Late Renaissance were indebted to the Latin rhetoricians. So Middle and Late Renaissance, this is around the time of Shakespeare. Therefore, Walker says, all of them, sir, are you sure? Wasn't it Samuel Johnson who said of Shakespeare that he had little Latin and less Greek? So if Shakespeare doesn't know Latin and Greek, how is he benefiting from the Latin writers of the medieval period, right? The problem here is, of course, that it wasn't Samuel Johnson who said this. Samuel Johnson lived a century after Shakespeare. It was Ben Johnson who said this. And everybody knows, and that's why everybody is laughing. So again, uh, Walker demonstrates that he's not always the most honest person. So I think that answers the question, right? I'm sure after that point, or even up to the point of his exam, uh, I'm sure you caught that he is a very dishonest person. Next question. How would you describe Charles Walker? Do you think that Lomax's explanation of his behavior makes sense? Why or why not? Please also consider his seminar paper and oral examination. Right, so how would I describe Charles Walker? First of all, he's dishonest. We talked about that. He's also arrogant. We talked about that as well. Um, so let's look at Lomax's explanation of his star student on page 137. Uh, here. Uh, Stoner has walked into Lomax's office and wants Lomax to talk a bit about Walker. And Lomax says, a good student, a superior student, I might say. Uh, he's doing his research. It promises to be brilliant, really brilliant. OK, so we can tell that Lomax really likes this guy. Uh, but then he adds a very curious comment. He says the research will not be what some would call sound. Sound here means healthy, complete, correct. Basically a good piece of work. So some people may not call it good research, but it is most imaginative. Now, uh, Stoner studies medieval literature. It's actually more history than literature. 
because it's all like really old literature and you have to put yourself into the place of a medieval person. So when studying medieval literature, evidence and careful interpretation is very important. Walker is doing his research on the romantic poets. It says here Shelley. Shelley is a romantic poet and the Hellenistic ideal, which means how poetry uh, is inspired and uh, continues the culture of uh, ancient Greece and Middle Ages Greece, medieval Greece. So it like when he when you're doing research on the romantic poets, the idea of romanticism, Longman Uh it's not like romantic love, like we talk about uh, using the word romantic today. It's more the idea that uh, ideas are more important than evidence, feelings and passion are more important than like thinking. Uh, that's what romantic means, or like the individual is more important than society. So it kind of makes a, a kind of sense that Lomax, who is also an expert on this part, uh, would like research that is most imaginative. It shows a lot of creativity, even if it's not exactly careful, good, sound research. Now, this could be a problem for Stoner because as a medievalist, he does care about careful research. Um, so, OK, that's that's a foreshadowing for a bit later. Now Stoner says uh, he's asking about Walker because he behaved rather foolishly in his class and asks Lomax if this is something he has to care about. And Lomax, his face immediately changes. Geniality means like sociability, uh, willing to talk, willing to like interact with kindness. His geniality had disappeared and the more familiar mask of irony had slipped over him. Ah, yes, he said with a frosty smile. Frosty means cold, a cold smile. We talked about smiles before, right? Uh, the gauchery and foolishness of the young. Uh, gauchery, sorry, gauchery. Gauchery uh, is a French word. Gauche is an adjective, sorry, uh, including the E. Gauche is an adjective which means uh, like ugly and does not fit in. So like it looks like it's trying to fit in, but it doesn't really fit very well, so it looks kind of ugly. The gauchery and foolishness of you of the young. So like he's saying young people tend to be gauche and tend to be foolish, which is true. Uh, Walker is, for reasons you may understand, rather awkwardly shy and therefore at times defensive and rather too assertive. Uh, so what are these reasons you may understand? Let's skip to the end of this paragraph. As you may have noticed, he is a cripple. Uh, today we don't use the word cripple. We use the word disabled, which means uh, he's disabled. So for that reason, Lomax says, he is rather awkwardly shy. I'm not sure if he really is awkwardly shy, to be honest. Uh, but and therefore, because he is awkwardly shy, he is sometimes defensive and rather too assertive. Assertive means like being aggressive, being forward, always uh, jumping into the spotlight. So. Does that make sense? Because he is shy and awkward, therefore he is defensive and assertive. Aren't these two like the opposite? Uh, I think one way to understand this is that uh, when Lomax says shy and awkward, he doesn't mean like today we would say someone is introverted. I think what he's saying is that his personality has been influenced by his disability, by the fact that he is disabled. Uh, so that he is always more self-conscious, more self-aware, always a bit awkward to himself. 
because he knows that his body looks different from other people's bodies. That kind of shyness. Uh, so in fact, in English, we would call this having a chip on your shoulder, which means you you feel inferior to other people. You feel like other people are better than you. Uh, so if that is the case, then it would make sense for Walker to be defensive and assertive. If he feels like other people are better than he is, he needs to defend himself and he needs to take the initiative in proving himself. Uh, Lomax continues, as do we all, he has his problems, but his scholarly and critical abilities are not, I hope, to be judged in the light of his rather understandable psychic disturbances. Today we would say mental condition, which is what we were just talking about. Uh, but it's very interesting the attitude that Lomax takes with, to talk about this to Stoner. He looked directly at Stoner and said with cheerful malevolence. Malevolence means to be evil or to be to be mean to someone here. It's cheerful malevolence. He's happily has like evil thoughts for stoner. And I think what's happening here is that he's almost like it's almost like he's daring stoner to discriminate against Walker for being disabled, right? When he says, uh, I hope he is not to be judged in light of his mental condition or his disability. What he's really saying is, I hope you aren't doing that. And if you are doing that, I will be very evil to you. I will do things to you. I will punish you. Uh, and I think one reason, or I guess the main reason why Lomax feels like this is because, of course, he himself is also disabled. Uh, so he himself understands very well the feeling of living in a body that most people think is strange, weird, and different. Uh, so when he sees someone like Stoner apparently discriminating against another disabled student, Lomax himself feels offended for the student. Like he gets angry for the student. Uh, Stoner's reply is very diplomatic. It may be that, Stoner said thoughtfully. And I suppose it's really too soon for me to be concerned. So Stoner doesn't say you're probably right or we don't know or like it's not that he's really dishonest. He's very diplomatic and says, oh, I guess time will tell. We don't know yet. But Lomax isn't over. He suddenly his voice was tight and near trembling with suppressed anger. So we know that this is anger. He is angry. You will find him to be a superior student. I assure you, you will find him to be an excellent student. Stoner looked at him for a moment, frowning perplexedly, so he's very confused. Then he nodded and went out of the room. So I think from the evidence we can see that it is in fact Lomax being angry on behalf of Walker because both of them are disabled and both of them uh, have felt discrimination because they are disabled. Or at least they think they have felt discrimination, right? They have uh, a chip on their shoulder. They feel inferior. It doesn't mean people actually treat them that way. They just feel like it. So from the evidence, I do think it does make the kind of sense, but the question also asks about his seminar paper. Uh, let's see. Where is this? Uh, page 140. I'm not going to read the entire speech to you, but I do want to say that this is an excellent, excellent example of rhetoric, of persuasive speech. He uses so many good speech tricks, right? He uses a heightened language, a more serious language. 
in a narrable, which means uh, inexplicable, something we cannot explain, something we cannot say. This is the first time I ever saw this word reading this book. Uh, and then this one, we are behooved to means we must, we should. Uh, and then the very next sentence, and yet finally, which is a conclusion kind of sentence, is the very next sentence. What can avail means what use is it? It's no use. It's impossible. Uh, and then like other language, like a metaphor of a veil. A veil is a piece of cloth that in some cultures women uh, put in front of their face. Uh, we cannot plumb, we cannot reach, we cannot understand. Like just the entire language of the speech is so. Uh, a bad way to say this, a negative way to say this is pretentious. Zuo, zuo. Uh, it to to be like so serious and, and lofty and, and uh, designed to be as to be over designed. Uh, and along with this language is the content of his speech. What is he actually saying? He's saying that uh, we must consider the source and of the mystery and power of literature. OK, already that is kind of. What does that mean? The the mystery of literature, the power of literature. Like, dude, you have to explain these things. Uh, but instead of explaining them, he says, uh, what can avail? It's impossible to fully understand the mystery and power of literature. So his entire paper, or I guess it's not a paper. He didn't write it. His entire speech is an argument for why people shouldn't study literature. And he's making it in a literature class. Jeez. Uh, so again, the kind of arrogance. Uh, and along with his speech, there's also his body language. His voice rose and fell as in a good political speech, not a scholarly paper, not a research paper, but a speech. His hand went out with its fingers curled supplicatingly upward. So he's like making a claw draw the drunk upward into the air. And his body swayed, moved back and forth to the rhythm of his words. His eyes rolled slightly upward as if he were making an invocation uh, here. That basically means as if he was praying. So even his body language is adding to the effect of treating literature as a power and a mystery that no one can fully understand. And in fact, Stoner sees something else. This body language is exactly the same as or it's a version of the way that Lomax teaches. Um, yeah, so that's the presentation and uh, Stoner notices that. Um, near the end of the speech. Uh, Walker doesn't even pretend to look at the piece of paper in front of him. Uh, it says here on page. 143 middle paragraph or the second paragraph. It was clear even to the most inattentive students in the class that Walker was engaged in a performance that was entirely impromptu. It was entirely improvised from on the moment. It became clear that the papers on the desk before him was only paper. There was nothing on the paper. He did not even glance at them in pretense. He did not even pretend to look at them. So it's very obvious to everyone that he's not actually talking about research. He's giving a political speech against uh, the very idea of studying literature. Uh, and 
it's arrogant, yes, but it's also um, very clever. Because if you have nothing positive to say, you can always say something negative. Even if you don't have the least idea of what's going on, you can always try to pick at someone's mistakes or to point out things that someone may not have noticed. So by giving this kind of presentation, Walker is basically choosing the easiest kind of presentation. He doesn't need to study anything in order to give this kind of speech. Uh, and he talks for an hour. My God. Um, so it's arrogant and it's dishonest. And when Walker finally finishes on page 144, sorry, 145, uh, Stoner treats him like a human being, right? He doesn't accuse Walker of of like lying or being dishonest. He simply assumes that Walker is a decent person and would know when he is caught and would not try to pretend that nothing has happened. So Stoner's first question is, do you have an explanation? Uh, which means, why did you do this terrible thing? But Walker continues to play dumb. What do you mean, sir? He does not give up, even though he knows that Stoner knows. And the reason it turns out is because on page 146, uh, when Stoner keeps, reminds Walker about how he had kept asking Walker about, like, is your paper finished yet? Are you ready to present? Uh, throughout the entire semester, and Walker kept delaying. Uh, it turns out that Walker knows that without having to submit an actual written paper, uh, he has no proof that Walker is lying. There's no way for him to prove that Walker is dishonest. So first of all, Stoner, just like when Stoner was interviewing Walker for his class, now he's again trying to test Walker to see if he can catch him in being dishonest and therefore uh, seal off all avenues of escape so that Walker cannot pretend anymore that he's being serious. So the first question Stoner asks is, OK, so what does your paper, uh, what does your presentation have to do with your topic? And Walker says, I approached my subject indirectly. Again, this is the kind of answer you can give anybody at any time, right? I approach my subject indirectly. Uh, if you really think about it, everything is indirectly connected to everything else. You can always approach some kind of subject indirectly. Uh, so Stoner says, uh, you know what? I don't I don't care anymore. Look, if you want to pass, you will write an, a satisfactory paper on the assigned topic within the next three weeks. Now notice Walker's response. On page 147. But sir, Walker said, I have already done my paper. OK, fair. He's still pretending that he has written a paper. But notice this next line. If I agree to do another one, I will be admitting. I will admit. And of course, what he would be admitting is that he had not actually written the first paper. So. This is the closest we get to honesty from Walker, right? He's, he's almost admitting that he did not actually do his work. Um, so Stoner, but it's still a reasonable uh, response. St if he really is innocent, he's not innocent, but if he really were innocent and Stoner wanted him to do this and he did it, it would in fact be admitting that he was dishonest. 
So Stoner says, OK, how about this? Just give me the manuscript from which you talked this afternoon. So hand in the work you have already done. But of course, Walker can't do that. He didn't do the work. Uh, so. Uh, again, he gives some excuse. The draft is very rough. It's very unprepared. Uh, but Stoner doesn't buy it. He says basically that's fine. I can read a rough draft. So Walker thinks of something else. Craftily means sneakily, cleverly in a bad way. Have you asked anyone else to hand in his manuscript to you? Stoner has not. And Walker therefore says triumphantly, victoriously, he knows he has won. I must refuse also to hand my manuscript in to you on principle unless you require everyone else to hand theirs in too. Ah, this guy is really hard to deal with. Uh, so Stoner, of course, has no choice. He fails Walker. Uh, OK, so up to this point, we see his arrogance and his dishonesty. But notice after he learns that he will fail, notice Walker's response. With the patient bitterness of a martyr, martyr is someone who dies for his beliefs. Xun uh, He said, I see very well. One must be prepared to suffer for one's beliefs. So he's turning this failure into a different kind of success. In a way, it's very similar to how he deals with his disability. He's turning the idea that people think he is inferior because of his body, and he's turning it around and trying to prove to people that uh, they should respect him because of his achievements and his intelligence, especially because he is faced with such a burden of his body. So the idea here is uh, if you take two people and they both have similar achievements, but one of them is also disabled, most people would think that the disabled person is more accomplished and is more successful because they assume that having a disability makes your life harder. So not only would the disabled person have to do all of the achievements, they would also have to overcome their own disability. Now, today that is not what uh, that is not the most accurate way of thinking about disability. Yes, disability makes people's life uh, more difficult sometimes, but uh, uh, there is not just one way to live a life. A disabled person may choose to live their life in an entirely different way. Uh, and so to say that they overcome their disability is less accurate than to say that their lives have been changed by their disability. Right, if you say someone has overcome an obstacle or a disability, you're talking about life as if it is a straight line and everybody has to lead the same kind of life. And that's not true. But uh, this is in the 1960s. Oh, sorry. The novel was published in the 1960s. This story is taking place uh, in th at this moment. This is around like 1920s. At that time, of course, most people did think this about disability, that it is a terrible thing, uh, including disabled people as well. Um, people who are marginalized or oppressed, you know, like minorities, uh, people often talk about like black people. The these uh, minorities often also think that it is a bad thing to be a minority or like that minority people are worse than the majority people. Uh, so there was a study that was done where um, psychologists showed pictures of white people and black people uh, to volunteers and then asked volunteers to like do a survey of like um, I think it was like 
how moral they are, or how how law abiding they are, if they are good people or not. And it, and for white volunteers, as you may have expected, after they see pictures of black people, their ideas tend to be less moral or like uh, less right righteous. But even for black volunteers, after they see pictures of black people, they tend to give like more negative ideas and negative ratings. Uh, so racism is not simply an individual attitude. It is the attitude of a society. If the people around you think that someone is worse because they are from a different group, even if you don't believe that, you will be affected by that. In Chinese, we call this Jing Zhu de Ci, Jing Mo de He. So here, even though uh, Walker himself is disabled, it's reasonable to think that maybe he himself also believes that it is harder to be disabled or like people look down on disabled people. And so by changing his disability from a liability into an asset, from an obstacle into a motivation, he's doing the same thing that he does here. He's changing his failure into a defense. The idea is uh, he's being failed because, according to Walker, Stoner fails him because Stoner disagrees with him. Of course, we know that Stoner fails him because he didn't do the work and he's dishonest and lazy and ignorant. Uh, but from Walker's perspective, it's because Stoner disagrees, and so it's unfair. That's why he's a martyr. It's a similar kind of reverse logic. Uh, this is something that we have not seen very often, and it ties into uh, how we can describe Charles Walker. He's not only dishonest and arrogant, he's also, uh, uh, we would call this self-victimized. He sees himself as a victim of oppression by society because he is disabled. Uh, and uh, finally, I also ask you to consider uh, Walker's stoner, uh, sorry, Walker's um, examination. So here, uh, his advisor is Lomax. And because uh, Walker is, has not taken enough courses, they can't really find good uh, um, committee members for this exam. So he, Lomax has to be there. He's the advisor. Stoner has to be there. He, his is the only class that Walker has taken. Uh, and then. Um, the person that they find who is, it says here on page 152, the three committee members have to be the advisor, Lomax. One professor who has had him in a graduate class, Stoner. And one person outside the field of specialization, so who is not an expert on the subject. Uh, and Finch has picked the new man, Jim Holland. Now, here's the thing. When you're the new person in a, in a group, you usually don't like to stand out. You want to figure out the rules and try to follow the rules, make people like you. So if something happens and something did happen, the new guy is not going to be the person who puts a stop to it. And we I'm not going to go through all the evidence, but what does happen is Stoner realizes that Walker is not actually answering questions. Uh, Walker has rehearsed his responses with Lomax before the exam, and he's now simply repeating all the speech that he has prepared. That's fine when Lomax is asking the questions uh, because they both prepared together. Uh, but then when it's, it's time for the new guy to ask questions, 
every question. Lomax steps in and sort of turns the question around or bends the question or adds just enough information to the question. For Walker to be able to give another prepared speech. Uh, on his specialty, so in other words, during this examination, Walker doesn't have to talk about anything that he doesn't understand already. And that's not what this exam is about. This exam is to examine whether the student is ready to be a PhD candidate, which means to, to start on the road to becoming a professor. And to be a professor, you can't just know your specialty. You have to also know the background to uh, fields that are related to your specialty. So for example, my specialty is actually American fiction. Uh, but I'm this semester I'm also teaching British literature. And in this class, we also talked about a French play. Right? Those are not my specialty, but I have enough background knowledge in order to teach it to you guys. And that's what this exam is for. This exam is to make sure that students have this background knowledge. Uh, but if Walker never gets the chance to answer questions about that background knowledge. It's not a real exam. It's a performance. Uh, so this is also Walker's dishonesty, but we also see that uh, it's not just Walker who is dishonest. Lomax is also dishonest. Um, why? Uh, again, I think it's because uh, as we talked about, Lomax feels sympathy for Walker because they are both disabled. And notice when uh, Stoner has no choice to but to flunk Walker's exam, uh, Lomax is also very angry. Uh, for example, page 162. Here. Stoner says fail. It's a clear failure and Lomax cries. Oh, come now, Bill. Uh, by the way, the word cry does not mean like with tears. Cry means to shout or sometimes not even shout, but like to give an outburst of emotion. So it's speaking with passion. Uh, you're being a bit hard. Uh, and when uh, Stoner brings up his seminar, uh, Lomax uses this as a way to hit back at Stoner, saying, uh, well, I've heard about that. This basically means like the what I heard is different from what you're saying. Like it's it's suggesting that Stoner is not telling the truth. Um, and Stoner, of course, he when he points out that Walker is dishonest, he has to note that Lomax helped him. And yet he can't say that Lomax is helping him because that would be accusing Lomax of lying and lying when you're a scholar, when you're doing research is very serious. Uh, but Lomax hears what Stoner is suggesting. And he gets angry. Uh, and then finally, Lomax's last outburst on page 163. God damn it, Lomax shouted. Do you realize what you're doing, Stoner? Do you realize what you're doing to the boy? And Stoner says, yes, he says quietly. And I'm sorry for him. I am preventing him from getting his degree and I'm preventing him from teaching in a college or university. This is important to remember. Uh, like we professors, honestly, especially someone like me who teaches literature, we don't have a lot of life skills. If you want us to go get a job somewhere else, eh, it's not really the easiest thing for us to do. Teaching uh, in university is in many ways just like any job. You find what you're interested in and what you're good at, and that becomes your job. Uh, and 
so here by preventing Walker from. Hang on. Are we supposed to stop at 40? <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry, guys. Uh, let's take a let's take a 10 minute break, but I will keep recording during the break, so please behave. And if you have questions. Uh, yes, inferior is the opposite of superior. Right, so let's take a 10 minute break. We'll come back at. Uh, what time is it? We'll come back at three sharp.
Uh, OK, and we're back. Hi, everyone. Did you want to ask me questions? While uh, I was away? No, OK, let's continue. Uh, where were we? Ah, yes, OK, so um, Lomax's final uh, effort to uh, keep Walker in the program is to say, do you, uh, do you realize what you're doing? And Stoner says, I know I'm stopping him from getting a job. Now, the thing I, I was talking about was that teaching is also a specialty. If you ask like uh, a computer programmer to not do computer programming and to do something else, that means the programmer has to start training for the other job from the beginning. Teaching is actually very similar. Uh, we professors spend all our lives reading and studying and learning. And suddenly, if you prevent us from getting a professor job or teaching, then we have to devote more time to getting another job and learning about that job from the beginning. So what Lomax is saying and what Stoner is agreeing with him is that by preventing Walker from remaining in the program, by preventing Walker from getting a degree and being able to teach, he is condemning Walker to have wasted all of the years of his life studying in college and getting uh, the PhD degree so far. Now again, that is no longer that that much true today. There are various kinds of jobs that are related to what a, a scholar learns in their specialty. And it's not too hard to transition from one to the other. Now, the thing about this is that for literature professors like me, our other career uh, options are all pretty terrible. They don't pay very well, and it's hard to to survive in these other careers. Uh, like if I wrote a novel and it was not like a very good novel, like at most it would probably sell like 500, 1000 copies after spending like years of my life writing it. So like literature especially is, uh, it's especially painful for someone like Walker to have to find another kind of job. Um, but we know that Walker gets in anyways or like not get in, but like he manages to stay anyways. Um, let's see, where is this? Uh, oh, there is. There is something interesting that we can talk about. Um, here, page 172. Uh, near the end of this section. Uh, and this is after Lomax has had an argument with Stoner in Finch's office. Finch, of course, now is the dean, the actual dean. At the end of uh, the second to last paragraph of this section, uh, Finch says, I wonder what it is between him and Walker. Stoner shook his head. It isn't what you're thinking. So what is he thinking? Uh, and I think most people here would think maybe Walker and Lomax are in a relationship. Uh, maybe a romantic relationship. Maybe they're related in some way. In other words, some kind of unfair arrangement. Uh, but Stoner says, no, that's not it. Uh, we've already talked about how it's more likely sympathy for a fellow disabled person. Um, and, you know, Stoner tries his best to keep Walker out. But at the start of the next chapter, we see that. Uh, because. 
Jim, uh, because Dean Rutherford had delayed making the vote of last year official, uh, it had been decided that Walker would be allowed to take his oral preliminaries again, so to retake the exam, but this time the examiners were to be selected by the chairman of the department. And at this point, the chairman of the department is Lomax. So there's no way Walker could fail. Such is life. Next question. Do you think Stoner made the right decision to fail Walker on the exam? Why or why not? So for this question, we know the facts. Walker is dishonest. He's being helped by a dishonest advisor. He really is incompetent. When Stoner asks basic questions, Walker is barely able to answer them. He only answers one basic question correctly. So why might it be the wrong decision for Stoner to fail Walker? Well, one possibility is as uh, Stoner and Lomax talked about, failing Walker would mean that Walker had wasted so many years of his life and had to learn another kind of skill in order to get a job and survive. So it's a single decision that could utterly change Walker's life and make it so much harder. Another possible reason is the political reason based on what happens next. During the exam, Stoner knows that Lomax is going to be the chairman of the department. He knows that Lomax will be an important person in uh, the politics of the university. Uh, and, you know, at the time he thinks no big deal, and it's true. He's a professor and professors cannot fire other professors uh, directly. Uh, even within the same department, the chairman cannot fire the professor. It has to be a decision by the entire university. What happens? This is the American university structure. What happens is uh, someone brings formal charges or formal accusations as Lomax threatened to do. Those accusations are then sent to uh, what is called the faculty senate. This is basically uh, the entire group of professors who cannot be fired directly. So it's fair, right? If nobody can fire you, if then the only way to get fired is if everybody fires you. Uh, and the faculty Senate will hold a trial uh, to examine the charges and finally they will make a decision whether or how to punish the accused person. So that's how that works. So Stoner quite reasonably thinks that he doesn't have much to fear from Lomax as long as he uh, he himself, Stoner, doesn't do anything wrong, right? Because if he doesn't do anything wrong, nobody can charge him with anything. He'll survive the trial. He won't be fired. Uh, but as we can see, he fails to think about other possibilities of punishment, such as later Lomax punishes him by giving him the worst possible teaching schedule year after year after year. Uh, so if Stoner had thought about how uh, Lomax could make his life miserable, that's another reason why maybe he should have just let Walker pass. And, you know, Stoner says, uh, Walker is the world, right? He's the kind of person that poses a danger to the academy, poses a danger to research because his skills are not the skills of research, are not the skills of learning. His skills are the skills of persuasion and influence and power. And so he's saying it would corrupt the university, it would corrupt the atmosphere of learning. But like he's just one guy. At, at the time, of course, there were not many universities. There were not many professors. So the idea of just one guy is not a small thing, right? One guy is, is still another professor, another influential person. But today, 
we have so many colleges and universities and so many professors at each one that no single professor on average is that important to anyone outside of their own little department. So if Stoner had thought about actual influence, Walker, if he himself could see that Walker is uh, incompetent, is lying through his teeth, other people could too. And so Walker's damage to the university would not be as big as Stoner fears. Um, and it's true, like after Walker re enters the program, we never hear from him again. He does not do enough damage to academia, to research, to the university to be worth talking about anymore in the novel. So it, we could say that Stoner, you know, maybe he should have just uh, and Bijian, like, you know, just let him pass. Why not? Uh, but if we come back to the original idea that Stoner has, he's not considering the results. He's considering the principle. On principle, because of these scholarly values, we should not let someone like Walker into the university system as a teacher. So this is one of those questions where uh, your answer might be different from someone else's answer. Um, if Stoner cared more about getting along with his colleagues in the university and getting along with Lomax, uh, he probably should not have failed Walker. But if we care more about the purity of the university, of that atmosphere of research and learning, then Stoner did make the right decision, even though Walker managed to get back in anyways. So it depends on what you care about more. And in fact, we can say that uh, Stoner would be a different person if he had let Walker pass. It is because he stands for this kind of principle that he is the stoner that we know. It's in his name, right? He's a stone. He's a rock. He's solid, standing up for principles. Next question. Do you agree with Stoner that Walker would be a disaster as a teacher? Why or why not? Do you agree with Stoner that Walker is the world? Why or why not? If so, why do you think uh, do you think Lomax is also the world? Why or why not? OK, so we already talked about most of this question, right? Would he be a disaster as a teacher? It depends on like. What you think a college teacher should do. If you think a college teacher should convey information, should give students knowledge, then yeah, Walker would be a terrible teacher. And it would be even worse than that because Walker does not simply lack knowledge. Walker pretends to have knowledge. So what he teaches would not just be wrong. It would be wrong, but it would look like it was right. So from the perspective of knowledge and information, it would be a complete disaster. But that's not the only thing college professors do. College is a time where what you learn is not limited to what the government says you have to learn in high school, in middle school, or what uh, the textbook that the school chooses says you should learn. Every professor can choose a different textbook or a different text. Each class teaches a, a different special thing. So college is also a great uh, time to, as they say, broaden your horizons to explore and experience and learn not just more things, but to learn about more things to run to understand and to see that there are so many more things that you could learn that you could uh, be interested in. In other words, imagination and possibility. This is something that Walker would be very good at. Right, if you think about his speech uh, during his the, the class on medieval literature, it was a brilliant speech. It was a really good speech. It's a terrible academic research, but it's really good speech. Um, 
it's it's it could be inspiring to the right kind of student, just like the way Lomax teaches, right? When we it says that Walker's speech was just like Lomax's teaching, that's the kind of teacher Lomax is. He's considered a brilliant teacher. And in that sense, it wouldn't be too much of a disaster. It would be OK, not bad. Uh, is he the world? Is Walker the world? In, in the sense that he brings in values that are not just academic, not just in pursuit of truth and knowledge, then yeah, he is the world. Uh, and like, remember back to that conversation uh, between Finch Masters and on page 167. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Uh, David Masters said something about the university being an asylum, a refuge from the world for the dispossessed, the crippled. But by crippled, he doesn't mean like disabled. He means like someone who is limited in some way. Th that the university is a place for the dispossessed means people who don't belong, who have no home. The, so the university is a place for people who have no place in the world. In fact, if you uh, turn back to page 30, here we go. Uh, here, Dave Masters. It is an asylum or a rest home for the infirm, the aged, the discontent, and the otherwise incompetent. Infirm means sick, aged means old, discontent means they're unsatisfied in the world, and people who are incompetent. But incompetent doesn't mean incompetent research. It means to be incompetent at a job in the world. And Dave Masters gives themselves as his main examples. Uh, Finch is incompetent, according to Masters. He's not very bright. Uh, but you're just bright enough to realize what would happen to you in the world. You're cut out for failure and you know it. You're not quite ruthless enough to be so mean and ruthless consistently. So he's he's not honest, he's not dishonest, he's not anything uh, enough. He's not special enough or particular enough in any sense to really succeed. He's just kind of there. Uh, Stoner, he says, is a dreamer, a madman. Uh, you think there's something here, you think there's meaning in the world. And according to Dave Masters, because the world itself has no meaning, you wouldn't survive the world. And then finally on page 32. Uh, is it page 32? No, page 31. He Masters talks about himself. I'm too bright for the world and I won't keep my mouth shut about it. And it's true, the world really hates people who are so much better than most people. Uh, the world hates people who they think are arrogant, but who are actually just, you know, more successful, smarter, better. Uh, at least American society is like that. They have a very anti elitist attitude. Uh, so is Lomax the world in this sense? I think. Um, Maybe not exactly. It's true he is as dishonest as Walker, uh, but he does do good research, right? When they hired Lomax, they looked at his research and his research was not bad. So like he's a good researcher who's like on the edge of the world. He doesn't outright lie like Walker does. He simply helps someone like Walker to lie. So he's very close to the world, but he's not exactly of the world. 
Uh, aside from what he does to punish Stoner, the rest of the department seems to like benefit from the fact that he is the chair. Or at least the, the department is not hurt by the fact that he is the chair. He doesn't ruin things for the university. So he's not really the world. I don't think so. Last question. Why do you think Lomax almost says we are protected by the tenure system on page 177? So this is what I was talking about, that they, the professors cannot fire each other. And the question says he almost says this. If you look at page 177, sorry, let's finish the question. So do you think this says, what do you think this says about his mindset regarding his role as a teacher? What does it mean to be a college professor? Uh, so page 177. Here. Uh, this is during the argument with Stoner in uh, Finch's office, I believe. No, no, no. Uh, St Stoner walks into Lomax's office uh, after getting that teaching schedule and to try to resolve their uh, disagreement finally. Uh, and so Lomax is fighting back. Stoner says, oh, you know, you, you know, I know we disagree, but, you know, we should at least try to be uh, civil, not impolite, not rude to each other in front of the students. Lomax rejects this offering of peace. He says, first thing, first thing he says, I don't think you're fit to be a teacher. Whew, that is a big insult. And he says, I should probably fire you if I had the power, but I don't have the power as we both know. We are, you are protected by the tenure system. So this is what we call a Freudian slip, which means it's a kind of uh, mistake that reveals what someone is actually thinking. And here, he's supposed he wants to say he's supposed to say you are protected by the tenure system, so I cannot fire you. The entire universe, uh, the entire university, has to get together to fire you. But instead of saying you, he at first says we. So what does that tell us when he thinks of tenure, when he thinks of the fact that professors cannot be fired by like other professors individually? This tells us that he at first thinks of himself. He thinks that he himself cannot be fired by other any other single professor. Why does he care about this? Uh, is it maybe because he knows that he is doing something that would be worth firing him for? Right, is he afraid of being fired? Uh, that's one possibility. Another possibility is in the same paragraph, he's talking about prejudice. And here he's talking about the prejudice that he thinks Stoner has against disabled people. So maybe he has gone from talking about Stoner's prejudice to thinking about all the prejudice that he himself had to face so that his entire student career uh, was very shaky and always on the edge of failure because people were biased against him. But now that he is a professor, nobody can fire him. That's why he cares so much about being a professor. No matter how much other people are prejudiced against him, they can't really do anything to him. It, that's another possibility. So his mindset could be a uh, I can do whatever I want as long as nobody has evidence or B I am safe from other people's bias and prejudice. I think both are possible. Um, but the bigger uh, point here is that when Lomax is thinking like this, he is protected by the tenure system. He is for already the chair of the department. He is the most important professor in that department, and he has the power that he's already used 
to make stoner's life miserable in terms of the teaching schedule. Even though he has this power, he is still afraid that other people will be biased against him and will oppress him. So that's why when I was talking about Walker, I said that he was self victimized. It's true. Other people probably did uh, bully him or have bias against him, but his mindset is now uh, already that he is so inferior to other people that he is always the victim. Even when there is no specific case, there is no specific proof. He always sees himself as the victim. The same can be said of Lomax here. When he says we are protected, he's thinking of himself as a possible victim, even though he already has so much power. And this is important uh, today as well. Lots and lots of people who. Are, for example. Uh, in politics, especially uh, Western politics. Especially if they're men or if they're like white men. Uh, often consider themselves to be targeted by society. Uh, here, here's the debate. For most of history, for most of Western history, uh, white men have been seen as like the standard person of society. Uh, white men have always had the right to vote as long as they had property. Um, white men had always had all of the rights of a citizen. The citizens rights were only slowly granted to other me to men of other uh, races and ethnicities and then later on to women. But men had these from the beginning, white men. Uh, so if we see politics as the distribution of resources controlling who gets what kind of support and money and resources. Then if we allow more people to become citizens and give them the resources that are supposed to be given to a citizen, that means that white men will start to get fewer resources. Within this society. Uh, so even though from a historical standpoint, what's happening is that society is becoming more and more fair. To some of these, uh, especially white men, but they're not all white men. Uh, for these people, they feel like they are becoming victims because it's the first time in history that they are being asked to give up some of their resources, which they feel like they should have, that these resources belong to them. So even when they do hold power, even when they do have influence, when they think of like this, these people uh, still think of themselves as the victim. That's also a kind of self victimization. And this is actually a very important influence in politics today. Uh, we, this also happens in Taiwanese politics when we're talking about like maybe the older supporters of like the KMT. Again, not all older supporters of the KMT and not only in the KMT. Uh, but many older supporters of the KMT feel like uh, the more the fairer distribution of Taiwan's resources is taking away things that they deserve. Even though maybe from the beginning, the only reason they had those resources is because history treated them better and treated other people worse, so it's not exactly fair. So this is an important attitude to understand. Uh, so like, why are people crazy uh, in politics? Why do people want crazy things? This could be one reason. Uh, OK, uh, so up to this point, do you have questions? No, no questions. Great. OK, if you do have questions, you're always free to ask. Um, let's take. Attendance. And we're going to take attendance by having you fill out one of these forms.
OK, so if you go back to the main screen. Um, hang on, let me end the recording. <laughs>